As some of you may know, I made a movie. A lifelong dream of mine was to make a movie. Scratch that, make a career out of making movies. And a couple years ago, I was crazy enough to finally take that dive. Here's how I did it. But before we get started on this video, make sure to like and subscribe if you like this kind of content. I will also have a link to where you can purchase or rent the movie in the description and in a pinned comment down below. Do you wanna make a film? I mean, do you really want to make a film? Are you willing to put your blood, sweat, tears, and sanity into your projects? Are you willing to lose a lot of sleep for your art? Are you willing to suffer constant roadblocks and rejection? If you answered yes to all of that, then you're on your way to becoming a real filmmaker. In this video, I'm going to impart the wisdom I gained from shooting my very first feature film in hopes that you all can learn from both my mistakes and my accomplishments. But mostly my mistakes. So where did I get the confidence to set out to make a feature film on my own? It was a mix of stupidity, naivete, and frustration. Being young and dumb is quite helpful in getting a start in this industry. So while you're young and you're stupid, use your stupidity to your advantage. But I had worked in the film industry for years before I set out making my first feature. I was an extra, a PA, a logger, an AC. I worked in the art department. Basically, I had enough hands-on experience with a multitude of sets to know just how a good set operated. And I think, more importantly, I understood how much work and dedication goes into making a film from everyone on set. It's important to get the shots that you need, yes, but it's just as important to understand how hard your crew is working. A real leader doesn't lead from a tower. He charges into battle with the rest of his men. To not be understanding of your crew is to not have their confidence or respect. Two things you really need. On the other side of the coin, if you want to direct a film, then you need to be understanding of your actors. I took acting classes in the years leading up to making my film so that I could get into the head of an actor, know what it's like to act for the camera, and comprehend the vulnerability of acting so that when I directed, I could be gentle. I could know the anxieties, fears, and desires of my actors so that I could learn how to act. Directing is acting. You might be freaking out inside because of a problem on set. You might want to strangle one of your cast or crew members. You might lack the confidence in what you're doing. And it's normal to wake up every morning and wonder, why am I even doing this? I'm such a fraud. But it's imperative that you exude confidence and tranquility. If you're calm and collected, then your team's morale will be high. So now you're ready to make your first film. Where do you start? With a script, of course. So you sit down to write a script and you're about to start putting pen to paper. And just as you're about to start writing, you find your hands freeze up and you just stare, hypnotized, into the blank page in front of you. Just a second ago, you were full of ideas and now you're just blank. What do you do? What do you write about? For your first project, think of your budget. Write about what you have, what you can easily, cheaply, or freely access. Save the big space opera for later. I knew that I had my city of Pensacola. I knew a lot of the people in the town, and so I knew that I could get a lot of the locations for free. So I decided to write a screenplay about growing up in this town. I took a lot of inspiration from Richard Linklater, especially with his films Slacker and Dazed and Confused, and so I wrote the script to take place over the course of 24 hours. Having the script taking place all in one day also meant that I didn't need a ton of wardrobe changes for my actors, which was also nice. Once you're done thinking about what you have, Think about what you know. Pour over your memories, your stories, your passions, everything you've heard. Pull from within. Tell us the story that only you can tell. The script started out as a sort of stage play, taking place in one location, but upon finishing it, it didn't excite me. So I threw it out and wrote a new script, dealing with the same characters. But this time, we follow them all around town which meant more location scouting. You know what? Why don't we go visit some of these locations? Here's the character's afternoon hangout spot. It was a gelato shop called Dolce Gelato, but that business's location has since changed. I love the overall look of the place, so I called and scheduled a meeting with the owner, Brenda. I was so worried that she would say no, 
but one of her first questions to me was if I liked John Waters. I answered, well, yeah. And after that, she told me that I could shoot here for free. The business was still up while we were shooting, so I think our production definitely surprised a few potential customers. Here's the club where we shot all the bar scenes. It doesn't have many or any windows, so we could film most of the nighttime interior scenes during the day. Because trust me, night shoots are not fun. Funny story, while we were all inside setting up lighting during one of our day shoots here, two of my actresses dressed in evening wear came outside to hang out and get some fresh air. While they were standing on the sidewalk here, a man pulled up next to them and tried to hire them for, he thought they were hookers. After that, we implemented a stay inside policy. And here's the baseball stadium in which a few of the characters sneak into. How did I get access to this? I knew the owner. He let us shoot here for a day, but things did get tense with the manager. In towns where film production isn't an everyday thing, people can have the wrong impression of what filmmaking is actually like. The manager thought that we would only take 30 minutes to shoot our scene, which I definitely didn't tell her that. She just thought that. I guess she was used to news crews taking only a few minutes to shoot their spots, and she thought we would be similar. However, feature filmmaking takes a lot more time. So there are two things to glean from this. Just make sure that you set a definite time and date for when you're gonna be shooting, or be a smooth talker, or have someone on your team who's a smooth talker. Situations like this, you can easily talk your way out of. Most location owners, they're pretty understanding and they would rather have you spend another hour there than come back another day. So just make sure that they know that it is in both of your best interests to get your time extended. Just don't try to extend your time by some unreasonable amount of time. Otherwise, they might just kick you out then and there. As for the house locations, we just used our own homes. It's perfectly acceptable to film at your own place or at a family or friend's place. No one knows it's your home and no one really cares. They only care if the set looks interesting. If the house you're shooting at has those boring white walls, you're gonna need to dress the set so that your movie doesn't look like every other student film. Now, the hardest location for us was the school. Getting a school location meant lots of paperwork and lots of money. We rented out a high school building at a local college. I guess it's a place for high schoolers to take college classes? I don't know. I don't care. I just know that we had three days to shoot there and they charged us an arm and a leg for that privilege. It's a hassle. Take it from me. Don't write school scenes, unless it's absolutely necessary, in which case, prepare for lots of paperwork. Film requires lots of paperwork in general. Contracts, NDAs, location agreements, rental agreements, usage of likenesses, insurance permits, and so much more. You can drown in it if you're not organized. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. I know what you're all thinking. How do I get money? Filmmaking can often seem like not that much shooting, but a whole lot of money chasing. I raised money for my film the stupidest way possible. I took out a loan with a high interest rate that I had to start paying back the month after I stopped shooting. Don't do what I did. I was stupid and overly eager to finally make my movie and I thought that no one believed in me, well, because I felt like I hadn't done anything to make them believe in me. Now, some people did donate to the film and I was able to raise several thousand dollars that way. And really, they were donating to be nice to me rather than to fund the movie. But I did learn the basics of pitching your film to investors. What do you need if you wanna pitch your movie to an investor? Having a script is very helpful, but you can bet on most investors not reading it. If they have the kind of money to fund a movie, then they're probably pretty busy people. So how do you get their attention and give them a quick rundown of the project so that they can decide whether or not to hand over their hard earned money to your film? Pitch deck. What's a pitch deck? It's kind of like a slideshow exported as a series of PDFs. It gives a brief synopsis of the film, shows what influenced the movie, tells the investor about you and your team, shows comparable movies to yours, and tries to convince the rich person that this movie is worth pouring money into. A pitch deck shouldn't take a potential investor more than a few minutes to look over, and it helps to make the slides really pop. You could crowdfund your movie, but if you don't already have a large following, then I wouldn't suggest you take that route. Okay, so the money has been made, it's sitting in your production company's bank account. In my case, I had about $75,000 to make my movie, which sounds like a lot until you sit down to budget it all out. That's when you realize something major. On a film set, what's the most important thing that money gets you? Time. 
Each day, you have to pay rent for your equipment, insurance for your set, food and lodging for your cast and crew, and you have to pay your cast and crew. Don't ask people to take weeks out of their lives for no pay. You might want to make this movie, but they need to pay rent and buy food. I didn't pay myself at all for the movie because I preferred to reinvest that potential paycheck into the film, but I made sure that my cast and crew were fairly paid. I would say that most of my budget went to manpower. There were about two dozen credited roles in the film, many of whom needed to be present on each day of shooting. But I worked with a fairly bare bones crew. Most of the crew were in front of the camera at some point in the movie, even myself. I think the only crew member who didn't get his close up was my sound guy, Schuler. My one actor, Andrew Williams, would act in one shot and then, when we turned around, he would be pulling focus. Everyone needs to pull their weight on a micro budget film. Conversely, sometimes crew members had to become actors in the film on a moment's notice. One night, a very important actor no showed. So I cast my personal assistant Noah as the character. The funny thing is, I think he was a better actor than the other guy. So it worked out. I even acted in the film. One of my leads dropped out the weekend before we started shooting. That's not true. Several actors and crew members dropped out the weekend before shooting began. So, while my co-producer slash cinematographer Keaton and I were picking up all the equipment in Atlanta, we also had to recast several roles and find new crew members. We ended up not finding an actor for one of the leads by day one, which just happened to be a day in which we really needed that actor. So, I stepped into the role. And it didn't go too well. At the end of that first day, I walked to my car, sat in it alone, and cried. I felt like I was having a nervous breakdown. I felt like it was impossible. I had bitten off way more than I could chew. But my crew saved me. They set to work on finding a new actor ASAP, and we cast a role that night to Jesse, and he was on set the next day. It was much easier for me to handle the film when all I had to focus on was directing. There might have been this question plaguing you right now. How could you not watch yourself? Couldn't you just watch playback? I couldn't, because we were shooting on film. Super 16 film, to be exact. Let's just start it over. We shot with the Airy 416, a top-of-the-line Super 16 camera that we rented from Airy Rental. It does have playback capabilities, but we thought that we could cut some corners and rent a monitor that Airy didn't recommend. That monitor didn't work. It certainly would have been easier if I had shot it digitally, but it wouldn't have captured the aesthetic that I wanted. I could spend hours talking about the technicalities of what makes film so good, from how it reads highlights and colors to its amazing dynamic range and the richness of the grain. But I think that it would be best to just show you. So this next segment was shot on Super 8 film. Questions I get a lot about film. How much does film cost? And how do you edit digitally with film? Well, one 400 foot roll of film costs about $200 and will net you about 11 minutes worth of footage. For my movie, I bought 45 rolls of film and I used almost every single one of them. So you do the math. The film has to be processed and scanned. I used Color Lab in Rockville, Maryland for all of that. Those guys are great. It cost me 17 cents per foot to process it, and about the same to get HD scans with timecode on it. I would send them exposed film, and in return, they would send me hard drives. Shooting on film forced us to think ahead. Film has a set color temperature and a set ASA. So if we're going to shoot outside with daylight, we should shoot with daylight balanced film, unless we had an 85 filter for our lens. And if we're going to shoot inside with hot lights, then we should use tungsten balanced film. Here's how you can read a film cam. The number is the speed of the film and the letter is the color temperature of the film. The speed is the ASA, it's how fast the film is. Think of it as basically like ISO. So, the higher the number, the faster the film. You can change the ASA in post by pushing or pulling the film. Pulling the film makes it darker and pushing the film makes it lighter, but it increases the grain. For all the nighttime shots in our movie, we push the film by one stop. So even though we were shooting with 500T film, it was more like we were shooting with 1000T film, in a way. I liked the increased grain and decreased contrast that pushing the film gave us. Plus, it gave my crew a lot more leeway in terms of lighting. Film gives a feeling that you just can't quite replicate with digital. I personally find the grain to be beautiful, but a less talked about advantage of film though is how it impacts the set. You can't watch playback, which really means that the actors can't watch playback. 
Instead, you watch all your dailies at once together as a cast and crew when the lab finishes processing the film. It brings everyone together and saves time when you need to save time the most. Actually, we weren't able to see anything that we shot until the second week of filming. So, for the whole first week, we had no idea how anything was turning out. It was a little nerve-wracking, but I had shot with film enough to trust it it would turn out alright. It also puts more pressure on the actors and crew to get the shot right. Our budget only allowed for shooting three rolls a day. That's 33 minutes of total shooting per day. So we could only get three takes at most per shot. It forced us to rehearse every scene over and over again. Everyone was constantly working. Every movement, inflection, and so on would be rehearsed. That also goes for the camera crew. You have to do camera rehearsals to get the camera movements and the focus down pat. Something I would do during rehearsals was film the rehearsal on a little Sony Alpha Series camera. The lens I had was comparable to the lens on the RE416 and I would adjust the internal settings to match the film stock. That way I could see a sort of preview of how the scene would look on film and I could offer suggestions on how to better the shot. It might seem like shooting on film was a major pain in the ass, but I loved it. I want to shoot every feature narrative movie from here on out on film. I'm addicted to shooting on celluloid film like how Patrick Bateman is addicted to coke. Now you might be thinking that since I rehearsed every shot to death in my movie, then I probably had detailed storyboards as well. No, not at all. For one, I'm terrible at making storyboards. Not even I can decipher what I draw. And two, my personal hero, Werner Herzog, said that storyboards are for cowards, and I am not a coward. Actually, I find that storyboards are creatively stifling for myself. It might be totally different for you, but I feel like they limit my creativity while on set. Also, on a project like this, we weren't sure if locations were just gonna fall through last minute and then we'd have to quickly find a new one, so I didn't wanna waste time imagining shots that we might not be able to get. However, you still need to stay organized. If you're not going to make a storyboard, then you at least need to make a shot list. What's a shot list, you ask? Well, it's a list of shots. Your shot list should have every shot that you want to get for each scene. Having one allows your assistant director to properly schedule your shooting days. But the other benefit of making a shot list is that it forces you to break each scene down in your head prior to filming. After making a shot list, what I like to do is to make a shooting script. A shooting script is just the shot list combined with the screenplay, with lines going down the pages to tell people how long each shot lasts. You're going to need a good amount of organization, because you will have enough problems to solve when on set. I like to think of directing and producing as being jobs where all you do is put out fires, manage crises, juggle egos, and try to maintain some sort of stability, all while hoping that what is on the script is actually being filmed. These are all guides and helpful tools to use while filming, but you should never feel like you're a slave to them. The best moments in the film are often accidents or spur of the moment ideas. There's an energy you get while physically being there with your cast and crew that you just can't get when you're alone in your room writing your shot list. So if you see the potential for a great unplanned shot, take it. In the same vein, I was open to changing up the script with my actors. I had a script that I wrote to be very naturalistic, but there's a difference between a line looking naturalistic on paper and that same line sounding naturalistic coming out of an actor's mouth. Because of this, I workshopped the whole script with all the actors, allowing them to put the lines in their own words. Some actors preferred to stick to the script, and some completely changed everything I had written for them. I had to learn how to work with both kinds of actors. Robert Gill, who plays as Chris, was more of a method actor. He was fast and loose with the actual words, but he was able to hit all of the emotional beats perfectly. On the other side of the spectrum was Carson Schaffner, who played as Brian. He had a background in theater, and so he was much more comfortable with sticking to the script. Then there was Celine. I would just give him a prompt and a basic outline and then have him go off. The way I controlled him was I would sit by the camera and I would let him know how much time he had left to finish his rants. It was up to me, the director, to make all these different kinds of actors mesh with each other. Actors are like snowflakes. No two are the same. There are other actors in this film that I have yet to talk about. The extras. You might think that extras aren't that important, but trust me, if you think that, you're wrong. 
Background actors add life to the scene. They make scenes feel lived in, rather than empty and lifeless. Here are some tips on how to direct extras that I learned. One, make sure that they're pantomiming. Rookie extras will probably want to talk out loud, but you don't want that. Remind them to act like they're talking without making a sound. Two, mix it up. If the scene is a bar or party, have some people standing in place and some others moving around. For the extras that have to walk, have an AD or PA direct them. Just make sure that the extras do the exact same thing in every shot to maintain continuity. And three, stacking. There are going to be extras in the foreground and extras in the background, naturally. The ones in the foreground will be noticeable, but the extras in the background will most likely be out of focus. If you don't have hundreds of extras to pull from, well then here's a tip to make it seem like you have more extras than you actually do. Reuse them, smartly. If they're in the background of one shot, then put them in the foreground of another. Maybe change their shirts or dresses to further sell it. Then have some background actors walk right in front of the lens to give some motion to the foreground of the frame and make it feel like tons of people are walking around the set. I even crossed the frame a few times to help with this. And finally, choose your shots wisely. It might be hard to make a giant room look full, but if you can shoot at an angle that only shows part of the room, well, you can at least make that little part of the room look full and people's brains will fill in the rest. Having extras in scenes is also good because sometimes, well, you need to cast a role on the spot and every extra wants to get a line. I remember that I cast Mario Brooks as Blake in the film because we had arrived at the scene on set and I realized that, well, I hadn't cast a role. I had all the extras read the lines to me and I chose Mario on the spot because, well, his line reading was the best. I honestly don't know what I would have done if the extras hadn't been there. What kind of lights did we use? Did we need big time Hollywood lights? What we used was one M18 HMI, which was daylight balanced, so we could use it to sort of mimic the sun. I also had an airy light kit, which were tungsten balanced hot lights, and my cinematographer had a set of tungsten lights of his own. But what we found ourselves using the most were china balls, or paper lanterns, or whatever you want to call them. They're cheap as dirt, and you just put a regular light bulb in them, but the effect they give is great. They emanate a soft, rounded light that feels real and makes the actors look good. We would just gaff tape and hang a bunch of these bad boys around our set and then use them as the key lights for our actors. But note, lights are hot, so I would definitely advise keeping them turned off when they don't need to be on. For our audio, we didn't have the money for a big mixing board that we could bring with us to each location. So we used a documentary-like setup. We used a mix of Sennheiser and Shep's microphones and we recorded onto a sound device's field recorder. I think it fit the tone of the film as we were going for a very realistic, quasi-documentary feel. Speaking of, we shot the entire film handheld and only on one lens. Both were creative decisions. My goal was if I paired a normal lens with a handheld shooting style, that it would approximate the feeling of the viewer being another student in this group of kids. Before I move on to talking about post-production, I wanna say one last thing, have fun. Not many people make movies, even fewer people make feature length films. You are blessed if you get to create one, so have fun with it. It's hard work, you probably won't sleep, and you'll probably be stressed out of your mind, so you really have to cherish the good moments. I remember how after set, the crew would drink beers and perform music. We'd also sometimes blast Death Crips or KKB while on set and sing along. We went on weekend trips to the beach together. It felt like summer camp and there were enough good memories to outweigh the bad. After we finished shooting the film, I immediately started editing. I had a rough cut done in about six weeks. I would have had it done sooner, but I had to manually sync the audio and the video. The creative editing came after the rough cut was done, as that's when I controlled the pacing and basically rewrote the script. I see film as being like cooking. Screenwriting is when you make the shopping list. Filming is when you buy the groceries. And editing is when it all comes together and you cook the food into the dish that you want. During the editing process, I'd have crew members and friends watch the various cuts with me. We'd all take notes on what needed fixing, what we liked, and what needed to be cut. I ended up cutting out quite a lot. The original length of the film was over 100 minutes long, and now it's only 84. Sometimes, things seem like they work on paper, but they just don't feel right on screen. 
Even then, I was missing a critical piece of the film, the senior roast video. We didn't have time to shoot it on set and it didn't need the full cast or crew to be shot, so we pushed that off until after principal photography ended. Still, I needed to shoot it before showing the film to anyone outside of my circle, so I racked my brain to figure out who I could cast. And the answer came to me almost immediately. B.G. Cumby. Was the horse a racist Trump supporter? Yes. The guy who trolled Fox News, 4chan, and PewDiePie. I knew he'd be perfect for the role. Plus, he had his DMs open, so I shot him a message. And he responded. After he got comfortable with me, we exchanged phone numbers, and I explained what I was going for in the scene. I sent him bios of all the different characters, and he wrote the roast himself. We then scheduled a shooting day, and we knocked out the whole thing in about an hour and a half. Ever since then, we've been best friends. I knew it would all pay off someday. Mr. London, he gave me the green light. Said he needed this young go-getter in his new vehicle. We just got on set. A few good professional men and women going to work. And we made a movie. A classic Hollywood-style movie. We all chipped in. I did my part. Jeremy did his thing. Isaac, the director, was holding it down on the directing side of things. We all just got it done together, you know? All that was left to do was have someone do the sound design, because that is definitely not in my wheelhouse, and to get music to use in the movie. Thankfully, I had a friend who did sound design for my short films, Gavin Salkeld, so I hired him. And as far as music was concerned, I had it chosen before filming began. I made this film with my friend's band, Jimbo, and many of the members of that band actually acted in my movie, so it made sense to also use the music. It felt like this great, big, creative collaboration. Now, my film was essentially done. It's weird to think that it was finished, like, two and a half years ago. Wow. Well, I had to play in various festivals. What I learned is that you need to apply to a lot of festivals because you won't get into all of them. You'll probably get accepted into 20 to 35% of them. The service that I used to apply to festivals was Film Freeway, and they have a paid subscription that lowers the cost of entry into film festivals. If you're gonna submit to a lot of festivals, I would highly advise buying that subscription because it personally saved me hundreds or even thousands of dollars. But not every festival is built the same. Some are great, and some just, some just outright suck. Look, you gotta do research into the festivals, but you might end up having to bite the bullet and show up at a crappy festival at some point. In which case, maybe take some pleasure in just seeing how low they can go. My movie played in a number of festivals, but its festival life was cut short by COVID, so I had to reconsider how to get people to see my film. I had a few distributors call me, but they all seemed shady. One agency emailed me and told me that if I didn't call and agree to their terms in less than two hours, then the deal was off. Um, no thanks. If they try to pressure you into selling the rights to your movie, then it's probably a scam of some sort. There are a lot of these companies that buy up low-budget features for nothing and host a huge library of them to, I don't know, sell them to Netflix or something? I honestly don't know how these companies make any money. I had another company that seemed more legit contact me about getting distribution for my film, but I was wary. They told me that they could get me on Netflix, Hulu, Amazon, everywhere. But then they added that if those didn't work out, then they would put my movie on their own streaming service. Adding to that, their fees kept growing, so it looked to me like they were trying to get me to pay them to put my movie on their streaming site. That's why I decided to just do everything myself. I'm still in the process of getting my movie out there for everyone to watch, but it's currently on Vimeo On Demand. I chose that as my first platform because Vimeo has the best image and sound quality out of all the different services I tested. I'll make a follow-up video either here or on the KinoCast channel to explain my experiences with releasing my movie once it's on more platforms. So where do I go from here now that the movie is out? I'm gonna be honest. I feel kind of lost. I don't really know where to go or how to get there. 
The movie that's out is something that 24-year-old me made, but I'm 27 now and my tastes and sensibilities have changed. I'm also a better filmmaker now and I would have done so much differently if I knew then what I know now. But that's the thing. I wouldn't know anything now if I hadn't made my movie then. I saw it as my thesis film or as my substitute for film school, but in reality, it was a baptism in fire, a filmmaking boot camp. I'm proud of myself for finishing it and I'm glad that at least some of the people like it. But moving forward, I don't really want to make any other movies like this one. But that's fine. I see filmmaking as a craft. You can't get better at it unless you do it. Hopefully each successive movie that I make is better than the last. That's something that I like about YouTube. It encourages me to keep creating and I feel like my editing and my filmmaking has improved because of this channel. Making movies is hard, very hard even, but it's not impossible. Until next time, I am the Kino Corner and I will see you all in the next video. Junkyard. Everybody's welcome. Uh, our guy ain't the real one. But he sure gets a job done. Uh, algorithm's failing. Hope you're good at swimming a day, day in the junkyard, junkyard life. Fell into a deep dark well. Met a bug named James. Asked him what he had to sell. He said nothing fit for human brains. Silly old junkyard. Everybody's welcome. Uh, our guy ain't the real one. But he sure gets a job done. Uh, algorithm's failing. Hope you're good at swimming a day, day in the junkyard life. Invite at the same time Holy, holy junkyard Everybody's welcome uh, Our guy ain't the real one But he sure gets the junk. Uh, 